Oh, no, different iPhone. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. I'm sorry. Hey. I think we're fresh. Is it almost good? I think it's almost good. It's very smooth. Okay, while, uh, while we're getting in the final stages of getting this ready here, um, let me just make a couple of announcements. One announcement is that um, on the seminar schedule for this week, there are, for the semester, there are a couple of holes in the schedule still. So if anybody has, has things we want to talk about, we'll do that. Uh, we, we can add you to the schedule. Also, I'm thinking about adding something like, uh, we, in the old days, we, 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 we did something called open mic sessions. People just come and talk mm -hmm. about their ideas, okay? So maybe we can do that too if, 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 uh, if we form rap. Say, say it again. Free format rap. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's right. Which <laughs> uh, are required to use all three displays. <laughs> 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 I thought open mic sessions were usually for mic. Which is apparently an ambic pentameter. jokes. Because, of course, everyone knows. Okay, uh, so uh, we're warming up now. Japanese keep, for keep filling up the time, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, it's it's I think, it, I think it's rhythm. off, Joe. It's, it's not and on. If it doesn't yeah, rhyme, it's, it's blank first. Oh. You press on, it oh, there it goes. There it goes. That's turns it off. <laughs> oh, wow. That's weird. No? God bless you. Thank you. I always sneeze twice. I don't think I've ever heard my sneeze just once. I go for three. Is that what happened to you? On that note, since we're filming time, I got a one and three are off. One and three are SAT answers. One, C, two, B, three. Okay, so this week we welcome <laughs> Kevin to the uh, <laughs> seminar, <laughs> and this uh, material is a core part of his dissertation, yep. and so he's uh, very interested in having uh, feedback which polishes and improves it. He's not interested in having feedback which uh, which assaults the foundations of the work. Is that fair <laughs> to say? Uh, yes, that would be that would be that would be fair to say. Uh, um, obviously, I accept praise. Uh, uh, which of course you all have because there is nothing wrong with this, right? 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 Okay. All right. So far. Once, yeah, so far. <laughs> so far. Except for the time like this. Back to the temporal There we go. Okay. So, oh, I'm sorry, yeah. Where are the uh it's far right, far right. yeah. left. Is that it? That's it. Uh, it, it did show. Where? Oh, yeah. uh, I can't. To, to the right. Isn't right, it over right. there? Right and left. It, oh, yeah. You've already right, filled yeah. the screen. You want to. No, you it's, want to the, it's on the, the full project screen. Project on the left. All the way down to the left. Tell me when to stop. Keep going. Now. Stop now. There. Yeah. Click. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. No. Should have worked. <laughs> yeah, it should have worked. <laughs> <laughs> 
didn't like that. Oh, it did work. It did work. It's on the screen. All right, <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Forget it. <laughs> okay. All right. It, can everyone read this? <laughs> yes. Okay. All right. So, all right. We're just gonna work on that. All right. Um, so, as Rob said, this is um, this is the second half of my um, dissertation. My first half was uh, presented in the um, uh, in the conference on in November uh, that we had here. Um, this part is on assessing the um, uh, the health insurance market on the individual health insurance market, uh, and then bringing the stuff that I learned from um, of adverse selection into the um, the age based model that I developed for uh, the individual health insurance market. Uh, next slide. Are you able to get next slide? Um, just a disclaimer, um, the views that I'm presenting here are not the representative of Vitor Corporation, which is where I work, or George Mason, which, you know, is where I'm at school, um, or any components thereof. All right, uh, uh, next slide. All right. Um, so just a, a quick overview. I um, want to talk about what average selection is, and then overview of the baseline model, which um, is prior to any kind of policy uh, elements. Uh, and then how I went about uh, validating and assessing um, and, and docking the model uh, and then implementing the policy that I wanted to assess uh, and see if that had any impact on, um, on the model that I developed uh, and then some conclusions. Okay, um, so to talk about average selection just as kind of a very broad overview, um, what it is is the uh, market phenomenon that occurs when you have asymmetric uh, information across traders. Uh, so if the buyer has better information on the quality of the good than the seller, or vice versa, um, you can come up with uh, with rigged trades where um, the the buyer um, knows more about the utility that they're going to see from the good than the seller. Uh, the seller, in preempting that, is uh, attempting to um, raise the prices because they don't want want to be, I guess, swindled. On th in this case, um, or it can happen in vice versa, uh, and this can um, lead to price increases in order to mitigate the risk, thus leading to fewer buyers. Uh, and eventually the fear is that this can actually spiral out of control. Uh, the first person to look at this was uh, George Akerlof in his paper, Market for Lemons, which actually won the Nobel, uh, or sorry, the Swedish Bank Prize uh, for Economics in 1997, I believe it is, with, uh, shared with Stig, um, uh, Stig, Stiglitz. Uh, next slide. And Spence. No. Uh, and Spence, not Rothschild, oddly enough. Um, so this was posited <coughs> allegorically by um, Akerlof. He set up a very notional model of used cars and how used car markets um, can theoretically work, obviously because used car, or actually um, how they wouldn't, shouldn't work uh, in his theoretical model, uh, but obviously they do work. Um, but it was first assessed mathematically in an insur uh, no a, a mathematical insurance market by Rothschild and Stiglitz in 1976. And the first part of my dissertation actually involves uh, replicating this or agentizing in an agent-based model. Um, where it deals with the um, differences in risk probabilities of buyers, uh, certain buyers being low risk, other buyers being high risk, and sellers of insurance not really having a way to determine which buyer is low risk versus high risk. And now this can lead to an ultimate um, uh, a uh, failure in the insurance market because uh, only high risk buyers will buy um, will buy insurance, and without any way to mitigate mitigate that, then the market fails in their assessment. Um, both asserted that only with symmetric information across the two traders or signaling behavior can a market uh, sustain itself. Um, this was <coughs> assessed both empirically and in game theory models by Cutler and Zeckhauser uh, in 1997 when they actually assessed the, um, the health insurance markets oh. in Massachusetts, um, both Harvard and the uh, Massachusetts group, um, GIC in the mid-1990s. And this the death spiral or market failure actually did occur in Massachusetts. So we do have empirical evidence of this occurring. Uh, and a number of other cases, uh, case studies, but this is kind of the, one of the more, um, uh, one of the more common or one of the more famous cases. All right, next slide. Are you gonna go through the intuition of the death spiral in these oh, slides or not? Um, I can go through it very briefly. Uh, so, uh, um, actually I'll go through it when I include the, um, the actual policy itself. All right, so previous models of health insurance, um, uh, there have been other models. Uh, as I mentioned, there was the game theory model uh, and other game theory models in assessing adverse selection. But um, the health insurance market, um, one of the most famous uh, studies of the health insurance market was done by RAND, the RAND Corporation in the 1960s and 70s uh, over on the, in the Northwest. Uh, and this is called the RAND Health Insurance Experiment. 
Uh, it's probably the largest and most well, uh, certainly the largest and possibly the most well-known study uh, where it assessed um, uh, elasticity of, um, of prices, um, the, um, desire, uh, the demand, the supply, a lot of things that economists are very interested in uh, for health insurance. Um, and this was assessed by um, Susan Marquis is one of the more famous um, uh, an um, analysts of this data, and she's developed a number of models on this, uh, discrete choice models and whatnot. Um, some of the um, more pertinent models that have been developed more recently are the micro simulations by the Urban Institute, where they use um, uh, a lot of the data from the RAND uh, experiment in order to assess the effect of policy on, um, on the health insurance market. Um, one of them, the health insurance, the um, person uh, was developed in 2003, and one of the ones that has reached the news lately is the HIPSM model, the policy simulation model, which assesses the large, uh, the effect, uh, impact of large policy implications, um, most notably the uh, import, uh, Affordable Care Act, which I will be getting into later on. Uh, and then there have also been system dynamics models that have been developed. Uh, next slide. All right, so going into Sorry for that brief inter um, um, introduction. Going to the um, the baseline model that I developed, um, because as I noted, I, I uh, we're not seeing any uh, large agent-based models developed of the individual health insurance market. And one might ask why the individual health insurance market. Um, that actually removes a lot of complications uh, when you start injecting uh, uh, employers and firms. That then makes the entire thing a whole much more complicated. Uh, individual or non-group market is where you have self-employed people or um, people that do not buy insurance through their employer, uh, by and large. So um, in this model, I, I developed 100,000 buyer agents, uh, which using the terminology uh, set up by um, Cutler and Zeckhauser are called patients. Um, so the three terms are patients, payers, which are the insurance providers. Uh, by and large, they're insurance providers, but they can also include um, government, such in, in the cases of Medicaid or Medicare. Uh, I don't look at those. But for the purposes of taxonomy, I use the term payers. Uh, there's also providers uh, who are the medical provider, medical care providers. Uh, I don't include those into this model, but that's the terminology that's often used between these three. Um, so right now, I'm just looking at the interaction between patients and payers. Um, 10, 000, sorry, 100,000 buyer agents, which is roughly on the size of a state. Um, that's roughly the size of New Mexico um, or West Virginia, that, um, that size of population. So. Um, over a million, but not like one of the biggest states. Uh, just to give you uh, a representation, uh, Virginia has 400,000 uh, non-group um, insured uh, people uh, as of 2014. So um, the buyer agents, to give you kind of an overview of how they act and, and, and what their parameters are, um, they have an income. They're, they're um, initialized with an income, um, which is exponentially distributed. Uh, based on uh, parameters, and they also with a heavy right tail. Um, there are a number of studies that have been uh, used to, to determine what the heavy right tail is. I just I chose one. Um, then they also have medical expenditures, which are um, determined by an autoregressive moving average model or ARMA model, uh, with one uh, one term for um, uh, for each. Um, this is this has been assessed by French and Jones. Um, these two parameters alone help to determine the, um, the expenditures and the, the, the revenue of each of these patients. Um, a lot of the micro-simulation micro models um, have a lot of parameters that define them, such as weight, age, gender, uh, married or unmarried, employed. Uh, I think one, uh, one person was bragging about the, um, uh, the depth of their model, that it had 167 parameters for each agent. <coughs> And I'm thinking into that and saying, well, what does it tell you when you change five of those parameters? What, 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 what conclusions do you get from that? So this model is only derived on the income and the medical expenditures of, um, of the patients. Um, and they're only making decisions based on those two parameters uh, by and large. That's what uh, the term is their heterogeneous nature. Um, each buyer agent then estimates the possible medical expenditures that they might experience uh, in the next year. Uh, this is based on their historical um, uh, behavior, on, on what their history uh, includes for how much they spent in previous years, as well as they have the, um, um, they have the possibility of, of suffering catastrophic um, you know, health um, expenditure. Uh, and they do take this into account. Um, 
as I mentioned with, uh, actually I might not have mentioned this, with medical expenditures, French and Jones, one of the, the key findings of their, uh, of their study is that uh, health expenditures have a heavy right tail, which is Pareto um, distributed. Um, and that becomes important because that's, um, that's often where you see the real cost movers for healthcare. Um, healthcare that is um, up in the millions per year, millions of dollars per year per, age, uh, per patient. Um, so that can really push the, um, the envelope as far as um, healthcare. Most, I think it was 99.5% of the population does not have that kind of, um, d does not experience healthcare expenditures in that um, heavy right tail, but that half of a percent that does, that tends to really push the, um, the costs of, uh, that, that a lot of these health insurers have to, have to pay for. Um, so the buyers estimate that uh, based on those two um, possibilities of a normal year versus a catastrophic year, um, then if they will choose to buy insurance, uh, if they can find a premium that is less than um, that, uh, their expected men, uh, medical expenditures. Um, actually, so you just say, um, patients can also be rejected by payers if their um, if their expenditures for the past three years have been greater than the out of pocket maximum that that plan sets it for, it sets forth. So this is indicative of a pre existing condition, uh, a condition that um, is regularly occurring and is becoming. Remember, this is pre ACA. Uh, I should note. So this is pre Obamacare, where patients can in fact get um, rejected uh, based on uh, pre existing conditions if it becomes too costly. Um, there's also a friction, uh, there's a, also um, some friction or inertia, so people are less likely, um, they, they, they need some impetus in order to change insurance plans. They're not gonna immediately jump ship the, the moment that a plan becomes one cent cheaper. So they, there is some inertia there, and I actually play around with that. Um, okay. So just to go over the seller agents, they start with a, a budget of um, 250 million. Um, if they go below zero, if they go into the red, then they leave the market, they are bankrupt. And all of their patients are, um, uh, are dropped. Um, very rarely in the baseline did I have um, payer agents go bankrupt, but that becomes more pertinent uh, <coughs> later on when I assess the policy. Um, they receive re revenue from the premiums of their subscribers, uh, and, um, they also, uh, and, and then they have to pay the medical expenditures of their um, agents, uh, of of their subscribers, uh, minus the uh, minus the coinsurance that each of the uh, payers, uh, the, each of the patients, um, go through. So, for the most part, that's twenty five percent coinsurance, uh, and coinsurance is simply a percentage of the expenditures beyond a certain point. Um, they then assess the profit margin that they received over the past year, and they update the premium prices based on that. Um, if there are zero subscribers, then um, they will go about reducing their premium prices in order to encourage patients from uh, encourage patients from the market um, to uh, sign up with their plan until they start receiving uh, subscribers. They don't automatically leave the market if they um, if they do not have subscribers. Um, if their costs are higher than their revenue, then they raise the premium prices. So we have a mechanism to raise and lower premium prices, um, as it were, in order to um, get the dynamics of the market. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, if the budget of the seller is negative, the seller will leave the market. Okay, next slide. So how do I go about validating these results? These are very notional uh, pair-patient relationships. Um, there are a lot of, obviously, decisions that go into how actual pairs and patients um, act. And notice that I didn't actually include any list of services that any payer provides. Uh, all I'm talking about is the uh, expenditures and the um, and the premiums that each uh, patient can be expected to pay, as well as each payer should be expected to pay. So how do I go about validating these results? The primary output metric that I'm looking at is the price elasticity of demand. As I mentioned before, the RAND health insurance uh, experiment uh, asserted that the price demand of insurance is roughly 0.6, negative 0.6%. If everyone who um, is not an economist, uh, in a word or in a sentence, um, elasticity is the amount that um, a price has to change in order for that quantity to change, um, uh, for, the, for the quantity to, uh, of what um, patients buy to, to change. So it's the slope of the demand. Function. Exactly. Okay. Um, so if um, if the price increases a dollar, then 
point six of uh, you know unit of um, of the quantity might uh, go down. So if, if the price rises ten dollars, the quantity would go down six units or what have you. Um, so as Axel mentioned, it's the slope of the demand curve. So what I'm trying to do is trying to replicate this um, the the Rand experiment figure of negative point six. However, I should note that there is a wide disparity in that number uh, by subsequent studies that have gone anywhere from negative point two, sorry, negative two to negative point one. Uh, almost universally, the the, the uh, elasticity is negative, but there are chances where it is it can in fact be positive. Um, I did actually receive positive observations um, of elasticity, but that was because there were certain other plans that would actually be increasing greater than those plans that received. Um, uh, subscribers uh, and uh, even though it raised the prices it's because some other plan actually raised the prices higher in those cases uh, actually next slide real quick when you say observations or you mean observations in the in the model output yeah yeah in, in my in my model output so um, this actually gives a representation so here is zero just for an indication um, the majority of the observations um, for elasticity are negative um, the uh, <coughs> The 95% confidence interval for the mean is right around um, 0 0.7, 0 0.6, and negative 0.7, negative 0.6. So um, uh, it's a it's a valid validation. It, it's a subsequent validation there, um, suitable validation there. Uh, the median is right around negative 0 0.10. Um, or sorry, the median is around 0.6. But obviously, you have a lot of um, observations around the zero, negative 0.1 mark. Um, you do have a couple of cases where the uh, elasticity is positive, and, and as I mentioned, that's when um, there are plans that actually um, they raise prices, but they also gain subscribers, and that's because other plans in the market have also risen their prices more than that plan uh, would occur. So this actually gave me quite a bit of headache uh, when I saw it because that's um, positive price elasticity is not normal. Um, it's it's normal for certain things called gel, um, gablin. Um, uh, goods, yeah, where, where the, um, the prestige of, of, of a good um, uh, gives it um, the, the, the added desirability. Um, but um, insurance is not one of those things. So, um, so it gave me concern, but that's, that, that was the rationale why. Um, real quick, next slide. So um, just to give, this is the, um, the measure of insured population over time. Um, there is, I, I'm not sure if actually it can be seen, but um, the number of insured across the population, across the, the 20 time steps that I use for each run, um, stays relatively constant. There is um, a certain cyclical nature to this. So I'm showing that the, um, the model itself is self-sustaining, uh, or, or you can see dynamics in the model that have not been pre-programmed um, in the agent behavior or in the market or, or in the, the payer behavior. So um, the, there, there is negative feedback to, um, to represent um, that the interactions are actually um, uh, restricting um, outrageous behavior uh, on both sides. Uh, next slide. I also wanted to look at the reasons why people remain uninsured. Um, the most dynamic reason why people would remain uninsured is what I consider the volunteer uh, population. So people who choose not to, be, uh, not to be insured because the costs of being insured are higher than the costs that they expect to um, uh, pay for medical care uh, due to you know the premium prices being too large. Uh, this is probably the most dynamic um, population. That's actually going to be the um, real core demographic that um, I'll be looking at for the policy implications. Um, other implications of um, uh, patients that are rejected, uh, patients that cannot afford um, insurance, and then um, the people that are dumped by the insurance is near zero. Not quite zero because remember this is only 0.5, uh, half of one percent of people uh, tend to fit in that heavy tail of um, people that uh, have outrageous um, um, uh, medical costs, and even those, it's usually a temporary, you know, one-year thing. So the number of people that have incredibly costly pre-existing pre conditions uh, is actually quite small compared to the entirety of the the um, insured population. Did your population age? Uh, no, but they're, they're, no. Okay. They do not age. And they don't, and they don't die. They don't age and they don't die, yeah. Uh, because then at, at that point, so I was actually considering whether they, sh they should age and die. Um, the concern with that is then I have to set up some sort of replacement schema. Um, and I didn't have enough data to really go off of how to, 
how to represent that. So. so the effect of turning Medicare age just doesn't factor into this. No, I actually don't. I don't. I didn't want to. I. I um, I made an exclusive choice not to look at Medicare and Medicaid uh, in this case. Um, mm. uh, it's that would just add quite a bit of complication to this model because that yeah. that itself is a whole nother beast. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. for the uh, guys who say like they have a mass, you know, like some major incident that only lasts a year, yeah. does that factor into their income later on? Or they're like paying that off? No, although okay. that's um, that is something that was brought up in Rothschild and Stiglitz was this idea of that an accident can affect one's income uh, later on, but it does not impact the, um, the, the earning capability of an individual later on down the line. The, the income of a person is actually just, it, it's set at the beginning. Uh, this model also doesn't take into account inflation, the assumption being that um, you know, rising tide lifts all boats, that um, if the income is rising, um, it's usually uh, because they don't age, it's usually because of inflation and also the medical costs would, would increase at relatively the same rate. Uh, but because they don't age, they're not, I guess, being promoted. Um, so I, I, the, the income stays relatively static for, for all of the patients. Um, this is just a look at the final premium prices. Um, I did discover that they were heavy tailed, um, but uh, using um, a really good software from, um, from Closet and Newman and I always forget the third Shalizi. name. Shalizi. Shalizi. Uh, determined that it didn't really fit to um, power law or log normal distribution, but it was heavy tailed. Um, so you have significant um, uh, number of um, high cost premiums um, later on the, in the market. Uh, a lot of these um, plans that would be catered towards people that have expensive care that they need. Um, but the majority of uh, plans were relatively in the um, uh, the the lower bar, ballpark of the um, of the distribution. Now these sellers are selling more than one plan. Uh, no, um, so the assumption is that each payer has one plan they are offering to the market. Um, it can be generally, and I mentioned this in the dissertation that uh, I know you wrote, but the, uh, it can generally be uh, represented that uh, a payer might have multiple plans, but that will represent, but there is no cost sharing um, across the across the payers. So the assumption being that um, each plan that might be offered by a pair is self-sufficient. Um, uh, so that, that's the general assumption we're going on. So no assigned risk pool? Uh, not in this case, however, will be. Uh, yeah, I, I, I do have that, yes. Yep. All right, so that was the second chapter of, of the dissertation. The third chapter uh, is the policy implications of the Affordable Care Act. Um, the Affordable Care Act passed in 2010 uh, the, the, the main goal of it, or at least the main proposed goal, was to make sure that all patients uh, applying for coverage will be accepted uh, regardless of pre-existing conditions. Um, so they cannot be rejected, they cannot be dumped um, uh, because of expensive medical care. Uh, that's what's known as the coverage mandate. Um, it's been known by other names, but the, the term I use is the coverage mandate. Uh, in order to make sure that, um, because if, if you just have this, the, the costs of um, insurance uh, will go up uh, exponentially or, or rise considerably. Um, and you know, Republicans and, Re Republicans and Democrats both agree on this. Um, it was just a matter of, well, how much? And how can we fix that? And how can we prevent that? And that was the ultimate goal of my dissertation, was to try to determine what policies, if any, can be implemented uh, in order to prevent this rise in costs from occurring and what levels would they need to be set at. So there are a number of other policies that were implemented with the ACA in order to try and stem that off. Um, the individual mandate is probably the one that most people, most patients, most non-insurance professionals would know about. Um, that's where all patients that are choosing to go without insurance, so the people that I called volunteers earlier, people that are choosing to go without insurance um, have to pay a, um, have to pay a, um, a penalty either a fixed cost if they are below a certain income or a proportional to one's income. Uh, at least 2.5% of one's income, one's taxable income, whichever one is greater. So this can be considerably um, painful uh, for people that are, um, that are high earners. Um, and so it, it, the, the, the hope was that it provided enough incentive for people that are healthy uh, and don't have high medical expenditures um, to go out and buy insurance anyway so that they can help with the people that are less healthy in these subscriber pools. 
Um, the flip side of that is the individual subsidies. This is not meant as a mechanism for, um, for subsidizing um, health insurance, but patients with sufficiently low income levels will receive subsidies um, to pay for the health insurance. This is a subsidy for the, um, the co-insurance, uh, for the payments they would have to make for medical care, not necessarily for the premiums. So the premiums themselves are not affected by the individual subsidies, but the co-insurance is. And people, um, patients actually take the, um, their expected uh, medical cares minus the uh, medical care expenditures minus the, um, the co-insurance payment into account when they're assessing, do I wanna buy insurance, do I not wanna buy insurance? Um, so that's, that's why the individual subsidies are important in this case. The three other elements that people might not be aware of if they're not in the insurance market, um, they're mostly payer oriented. So risk adjustment is probably something that you might have seen in the news because it is a very contentious issue. Um, it is essentially a wealth transfer. Um, payers that have low risk subscriber pools will pay um, a, a um, radiated amount um, payers with higher risk subscriber pools. Um, and there's a lot of discussion, a lot of analytics that go into determining just how much lower payer, um, uh, sorry, uh, low risk subscriber pools uh, payers will have to pay those higher risk payers. Um, and that, that's a, an area of considerable debate and discussion, um, uh, but it has quite a, quite a bit of impact to the, to the model itself, as you'll see. Um, reinsurance is where if a, um, um, if a payer has to pay so much, uh, a considerable amount uh, for, for a certain patient, uh, say in the order of millions, as I was mentioning earlier, then in order to prevent bankruptcy or prevent um, uh, that considerable loss, um, they can pay into their own insurance um, pr uh, a certain cost per subscriber head. And then um, if the, 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 cost, the, the medical cost expenditure for a for a patient is considerable. I think it's above ninety thousand for two thousand sixteen. If it's above ninety thousand dollars a year, then um, the the payer will receive a payment from that insurance um, uh, from that insurance fund. Um, uh, and and um, that's the the hope is it'll stem off the, um, the the pain of having to pay a considerable amount all at once. Um, then you have risk corridors where um, payers have to set a certain target amount. Um, an amount that they expect to, um, to pay for medical expenditures and also research, although I don't take into account research. Um, and if they fall short of that, the, the target amount is usually 80% of the revenue that they receive from, from premiums. If they fail to meet that target amount, then they have to pay a penalty. And if they shoot over that amount, then they receive um, reimbursement, as it were, or subsidy. Um, and this has actually created quite a bit of contention among payers Does as well. Does that actually exist? Exist now oh, it does. Oh, it does. Actually, I go into it. Uh, it exists. Encourage waste and drive up the cost for everyone. So um, it does not. However, what does happen, or what has happened, is um, this is going more into the actual what what actually has happened rather than what's in the model, um, is that payers have become overly cautious, as it were, and then they um, they constantly overshoot their market, uh, the, the target, which has actually also occurred in my model, um, and so the. Um, uh, the Office of Management and Budget um, has had to, you know, they said, if you overshoot by such and such amount, we will pay you this amount. And they, they set up the algorithm and they couldn't pay that uh, right. later on. Uh, so they were paying 12 and a half cents on the dollar. Uh, so they overshot it by eight, by eightfold um, uh, as of recently. I should note that reinsurance and risk corridors were only meant to be, and they are only temporary measures for 2014 to 2016. I run for the entire um, the entire duration of the model. Uh, risk adjustment is supposed to be permanent. Uh, that's a um, that's that's a, a policy oriented towards constantly preventing um, adverse selection, as opposed to these two, which were only meant to stabilize the market uh, as the ACA came forward. Next slide. Um, so how I implemented these, um, the coverage mandate pretty straightforward. Just you know, I turn off the toggle where you know payers are able to to reject um, patients. Um, individual mandate, unsubscribed patients will have to pay either six, $695 per turn per year um, or 2.5% of their taxable income, whichever one's greater, uh, and they will have to take this into account when they are choosing whether to um, not buy insurance or to, well, if they, if they choose to switch insurance, it do doesn't matter to them, but if they choose to drop their insurance, leave their insurance plan, they will have to take this account, uh, cost into account. Uh, and then the individual subsidies, um, 
there's an algorithm, there's a, um, a stepwise algorithm for determining how much they get per subsidy. Next slide. Uh, oh, yes, okay. So the risk adjustment, um, because I didn't want to have, as I mentioned before, there's been a lot of academic writing on how exactly to calculate the risk of each patient um, and how you keep that um, anonymized um, uh, to determine, you know, how do you assess the risk of a certain subscriber pool given millions of subscribers per plan? I mean, imagine um, Aetna the, the, or, or Blue Cross Blue Shield, the, the millions of subscribers they have nationwide. How do you, and also, you know, segmented by each state, how do you assess the mean risk of that subscriber pool? Um, and then how do you compare that to the, um, the, the mean risk of some other insurance company? Um, so how I determined it is just, I, I took the, um, the medical expenditures of that entire subscriber pool in the previous um, year, and that was their risk. Uh, and so I could ascertain how much, um, uh, how much risk uh, one payer would be compared to another and putting into dollars and cents. Um, this is what I would consider the ideal, uh, what, um, what people who set the risk adjustment uh, algorithm would consider the ideal. Um, um, assessment of risk. Uh, it's not how they actually do it, but regard, um, outside of getting into some very complex actuarial math, which because I don't have an accounting degree, um, then uh, I, that was the abstraction that I went with. Um, reinsurance, as I mentioned, all payers go in, uh, pay into a uh, reinsurance fund, $27 per subscriber they have, and if the um, payment is higher than the attachment point, as they say, $90,000. Uh, and then the reinsurance fund will make up the difference. Uh, and then the risk corridors, each payer has that target uh, number, and if they go above that target number or below, then they have to pay or they get paid by it, um, as the case may be. Next slide. So the metrics of the simulation model, one of the, um, one of the main elements was to see what was the effect on the unsubscribed population, most notably the people who volunteer to leave the, the health insurance market or volunteer to go outside of um, the, the health insurance market. Um, the other key metric is the premium prices. Um, so determining how, how much of an effect this has on the, um, on the price of insurance across the market. Um, another interesting mar uh, measure that I didn't think would be, I didn't think was gonna be as important until I actually ran the model and saw that it was quite important was the number of payers in the market. Um, the number of payers that, that remain in the market uh, that, that keep subscribers on their books and, um, and remain um, solvent. Uh, have actually a, a, um, a profit margin, um, as well as the net system gains from the payments of um, reinsurance and risk corridors. Next slide. So the insured populations, I, um, I should note that the, um, the experiments that I ran, uh, I wanted to look at each uh, policy both in isolation as well as in combination of one another. Um, so I ran a full factorial view uh, essentially turning on and off these policies um, in combinations with one another. One of the um, committee members that I have on my committee, uh, a guy named Len Nichols, Dr. Len Nichols over in the College of Health and Human Services, um, said, well, look, these policies were all implemented in order to, to work together. So the, the findings that you have of each one individual can be somewhat misleading. So I should probably note that that, that, is, a, that is a criticism that I've had. Um, however, I did, you know, readjust the dissertation uh, in order to, to take that into account. Um, so individual and coverage mandates caused the greatest decrease in uninsured patients, um, but all policies that I, that I uh, invented actually had an impact in this. Um, the the uh, individual mandate um, actually decreased the volunteer population considerably to the point of near zero. Um, so. Uh, as far as it acting as a um, deterrent, uh, it worked. Um, what I did not look at, and I just read about this a couple of days ago, that apparently um, the IRS is no longer receiving, or no longer validating uh, payments for the individual mandate. So I did not actually look at that, where this is just sort of hearsay and not actually people having to pay into the individual uh, uh, mandate. So if you're filing taxes and you don't have insurance, um, talk to your talk to your tax advisor about not having to pay that individual mandate because it might save you a couple of hundred bucks. Um, patients that are unable to afford uh, insurance obviously decreased <laughs> with the individual subsidies, but not down to zero. So this did not, um, this did not 
alleviate all the people that were unable to buy insurance, but it, it uh, alleviated a considerable amount. Um, and as I said, patients choosing not to participate decreased considerably with the individual mandate, uh, but it did increase with the coverage mandate, as what we would expect. If you're just implementing the, the coverage mandate, um, then uh, the premiums will, in fact, go up, um, as, as suspected. And so people that are saying, no, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna pay this premium, I'm, I'm leaving the market. Um, that's expected to go, those people were expected to go up. Um, and patients that were dumped by their insurers uh, decreased with the risk quarters, but they increased considerably, not only with the individual mandate, but especially with risk adjustment. And we're actually gonna be going into that a little bit later. So why would the number of people that were dumped by their insurers go up with risk adjustment? Risk adjustment is very uh, focused on the payer. The reason why is that Payers in the market considerably decreased when you included risk adjustment. So risk adjustment caused a, um, an immense uh, concentration of payers, or sorry, of patients <coughs> into one payer, or maybe two payers. Um, this has actually been validated by, um, by a number of studies done by the Kaiser Family Foundation, where I think 70% um, of the counties in the United States now only have one or two insurance payers, uh, insurance, uh, um, insurance companies that are offering insurance plans. Um, so what you saw is a, a, um, a mass exodus of payers from, uh, from this market. Um, I actually use the, um, the Gini coefficient of patients that are um, with you know, each payer. Um, and what you saw was uh, all the payers, or all the patients moving to one payer and maybe a couple uh, lending to, to second or third payers, but about 95% of all patients would move into that one payer. In, in, the, in the model. Did you have a question? Yeah, are they the same national companies, same one or two national companies in, in each of those 70, 70 counties? Or no, they're not. Different ones? Uh, they're different ones, but they're usually one of the, the five big ones. Uh, something I, I did not know, um, there, prior to, to the ACA, there were 13,000 insurance companies. Um, try, try naming five. Uh, and and the, 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 the five, because the five that we general, five or six that we might know, uh, people that are not in insurance um, uh, insurance market uh, are the five biggest, or the ones that are almost everywhere. You know, Aetna, Blue Cross Blue Shield, Kaiser Permanente, uh, Humana. I'm, I'm trying to even think of a fifth. Cigna. Cigna. Okay, there you go. Fifth. Oh, there's five. Okay, there's a, but they, those are the ones that are that are um, that are the large ones that are able to be in almost every market. But those are the um, they they might um, focus on one or two regions. Um, so it's not, it's not different ones for those counties, but um, you see the same ones being in each of those counties. Um, so I think Kaiser Permanente might be in the south, southeast, um, and uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield might be in the northeast. Uh, I'm not too familiar with the, with the western part of the United States, so I don't know what insurance would be there. Kaiser's big in the west. Kaiser, Kaiser's big in the west. Um, so that's, um, but it is these the same larger companies. Uh, at least that's the empirical evidence. Human is big in the central U.S. and okay. in Southeast. Yeah. yeah. But just to clarify a couple of things there. Sure. Was, um, so yes, yeah, so, they, so yes, half of American counties have only one, one, one or two. Well, I think it's, well, yeah, that, it's it's one or two is like sixty or seventy percent, but, but yeah. half have only one. Uh, but, might but be. it's only ten percent of the population. That so might very well be true because uh, because a lot of it is is yeah. in the, um, the the these large counties that have a very it's low population true. density, and also then and what is it? Go on. so that's an important clarification. Yeah, um, premium prices, um, as we expect, would uh, did increase with the um, the coverage mandate, but it um, decreased considerably with the risk adjustment. So risk adjustment proved to be quite a considerable um, uh, negative feedback on the premium prices. But the contrast was that it caused a great concentration of patients into um, into many fewer pairs, into into far fewer pairs, uh, and many of the other pairs then left the left the market. Um, next slide. Uh, net system gain. Um, the loss that was uh, incurred by the by the system was almost entirely by the um, the insurance subsidies. Uh, the the. Um, the loss over the 20 year period was 2.1, 2.2 billion dollars. Uh, and that was not made up for by the other mandates, which only made about 400 million. Um, so they only made up about a fifth of this enormous loss. And you should know, uh, you know as I note, um, this is only 100,000 um, agents. Um, the, the, the system itself has several million 
Um, I believe it's somewhere close to 10 to 20 million non-group um, uh, insured people in the, in the non-group market or the individual health insurance market. Um, so um, insurance subsidies will need to find some other form of revenue in order to make up for, for the losses from insurance subsidies. Um, the reinsurance fund operates actually at a net positive um, in the, the 10 to 20 million. Uh, didn't really have much impact, however, on the prices or on the subscriptions. Um, the risk corridor fund is regularly at risk of running a deficit. Um, and as I mentioned before, um, you have a lot of insurers that will over um, estimate or over overset their their target, and then they get paid up um, paid you know cents on the dollar uh, when they are reimbursed. Um, there's actually empirical evidence for this, and um, fortunately, this is only um, a, a temporary measure. Uh, I don't know whether it will continue. Um, so, um, but it has shown to be um, quite the net loss for insurance companies as a whole. Next slide. So conclusions. Uh, individual and coverage mandates led to reduction in the, the number of uninsured, but at their cost of increased premiums. So the, the, the premiums, when you just looked at the individual and coverage mandates, um, those did in fact increase. Um, uh, however, um, the risk adjustment um, leads to the mitigation of these, of these insurance premiums going up, but at the cost of the concentration of the market into one or two pairs. So um, also that individual subsidies will require some external source of revenue. Um, the ultimate, uh, the, 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 really the primary conclusion of this study is that um, there's no silver bullet. There's no um, magic set of, uh, of policies that are going to <coughs> fix everything, you know, there's cause no free uh, lunch. There's no free lunch. There's no <laughs> there's no way to, to have lower premium prices with a wide variety of choices for the market um, that everyone can find the the, the choice that they want and everyone's going to get the coverage they want and also people that are costly is go are, are going to be able to find cheap and affordable insurance that we're going to be able to subsidize um, and give puppies to everyone. Um, also note that risk insurance and uh, risk corridors and reinsurance made little impact on the actual patient experience, but um, uh, but it did have quite an impact on the associated funds um, with those policies. Um, and with that, next slide. Um, I just want to end with a kind of thing from one of my one of my committee members. Um, this is the, 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 the proposal of defense was, was public, so I'm, I feel okay with saying if you make both Republicans and Democrats mad at you, you've done your job correctly. Um, so um, that was from one of my committee members, Bill Kennedy. Um, but are, are there any questions on what I've done? Have you met uh, that standard? Have I met that standard? I don't know. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know whether whether Republicans and Democrats are met. We, we won't know until yeah, we, wild. yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Although I I will say that Len Nichols uh, uh, was very intrigued by by what I presented. Um, especially on the risk adjustment issue, uh, because he's actually been quite on the forefront of, of these talks um, of you know assessing how do you assess risk adjustment. Um, and he said, "Look, if the, if the findings you have here, this you know somewhat monumental, so uh, I'd like to see you push this further uh, after the dissertation defense." Um, uh, and um, and and um, have this you know progress into a real actual um, sandbox for assessing policy. Um, as I mentioned in the dissertation, I didn't mention this talk. Uh, I wrote this in, uh, I, I did much of the analysis September, October, November of 2016 uh, when we assumed, uh, I assumed, you know, uh, and I think some other people in this room may have assumed that the election would turn out differently um, than it actually did. Uh, now with talks on Capitol Hill and the White House being that the ACA is going to be um, um, scrapped and replaced. Um, it's next week. Uh, perhaps as early as next week. I didn't hear about that. Yeah. But um, this then might pose as a very interesting um, policy experimentation tool of um, you know what the impacts of policy suggestions or, or, or implementations might be um, later on down the line. So. See, I'm sorry. Sure, sure. You actually think that the decision that's going to be made in a week is based on any kind of facts that modeling would improve that decision? Please. Well, it's, 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 it's post, post hoc analysis of, you know, validating that, oh, it was right all along, or, 
we should have known that this was coming, even though the analysis was done like six, no. eight, ten months after. Everyone knows I think it's a bad decision. Depends. A a after, if what I read in the news happens and it's it, they submit the same bill that they've submitted four times already, in pass it this time, um, then they have to replace it with something, and this type of research is useful for whatever comes after because the federal government is in this business whether it wants to be or not. You know. That Pandora's box has been opened. Yeah. yeah. Yes? But if the Obamacare reduced the number of insurance companies, there used to be 13,000 and now that's been greatly reduced and 50% mm -hmm. of counties only have one payer, so now mm -hmm. you don't have the marketplace forces that, you know, it, a, it was anticipated that if you could replace Obamacare, you would then be able to let the marketplace, you know, go into effect. And now you don't have that because you have monopolies. Yeah. Well, so I how are you going to get around having monopolies? So um, <laughs> I'll, I'll go back to the abstraction that I mentioned earlier. That um, you know, as Rob said, I, I'm, uh, each payer is assumed to have one plan. Um, and you can abstract away saying that well, you might have multiple plans by a single payer, uh, by, by by one insurance company. Uh, but there's no transfer of wealth between those plans. Um, what you could have is then a propagation, not necessarily of different companies, but different plans provided by the same company. Uh, or these five monopoly. or six, that's true. Yeah, or on, these I, think, I think we're getting a little bit tied up in terminology, yeah. though. Yeah. It's, it's, it's my, my, my understanding, you can just correct if this is wrong, but the, 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 no, the, the 10,000 plus, not, not only a few, is actually an artifact of all these of all the risk pooling. It yeah. used to be the case that Blue Cross Blue Shield of Delaware, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Erie County, was a separate company. It was counted as separate That's before, okay. and yeah. now you just have Blue Cross Blue Shield Anthem or something. As at the at the national level, in order for the for, to do the to do the risk calculation, or in order to do the risk compensation. Problem. Yeah, I mean, yeah. So, so that's the empirical thing. That's not so in you, the model. You shrunk ten thousand. You used to have ten thousand Blue Cross Blue Shields. Now you have one, but that's not really that. So I. I, I so actually, uh, well, uh, according to. Uh, I believe that the case was actual. Um, it, it wasn't. It wasn't segmented like that. It wasn't segmented un under these umbrella companies. It was in fact different insurance companies yeah. that did not have um, cor uh, a correlation between one another. They couldn't uh, share but, uh, but I will. I what? They couldn't share funds. They yeah, couldn't but share that, funds. That's just, but yeah, that's just because, in other words, Blue Cross and Blue Shield in two different counties, and a, a company that operated in both counties could pick mm -hmm. which one they wanted to. They wanted to. I will, I will dig deeper on that because I, I admit that I only actually saw the number itself. I didn't actually dig deeper on what those 13,000 were. put it this way. There's not been, um, you know, the, for, for, the, you know, for the healthcare administrators, there's, there's not been a giant shakeout of 13,000. We, have, we haven't seen a collapse of 13,000. No, 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 that's true. That is true. Um, we haven't even seen a collapse of, uh, of, of, um, of even half that. Um, but but lack of competition. But lack of la lack of co competition, <coughs> as well as and, and this model itself does not look into the services that are provided by these plans. But that is mm -hmm. that is at risk when you have the the, the, the concentration uh, into one or two plans. Of you know, do, does someone need to um, pay for um, alcohol? Um, uh, or, uh, I guess therapy or, or what um, alcoholism therapy if they don't drink. Um, I can imagine, you know, Utah not having a real big problem with alcohol therapy. Uh, 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 they might, they might, I don't know. I don't know. It's, so, a it's a theory. It's a theory, it's a theory. I'll, 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 I'll stop before I say too much. As I said, MITRE company, MITRE Corporation nor George Mason endorse the views that I, I present in this presentation. Did you have a question? Um, yeah, you could look at two things that are a related phenomena. We've had Medicare for a long time. Sure. And we know that in Medicare, what happened was with a single set of payment rules, even though you have competing companies, there's a change in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that happens is certain con payment for certain conditions gets driven out. Mm -hmm. There's an, an informal but very effective collusion around a, a set of payment guidelines. And mm -hmm. it becomes very hard to get certain kinds of treatment paid for under mm -hmm. Medicare. There's also, because of that downward cost, uh, that cost containment pressure, mm -hmm. an increasing number of providers who opt out of Medicare mm -hmm. because it's, it's not paying them as, as much as they think they can get elsewhere. One of the Republican favorite answers to the question of competition has been, oh, fine, the problem is they're monopolies because you're looking county by county or, at, at or, state, or by state. state by state. Why don't we open the competition mm -hmm. across geographic borders 
and that will reintroduce competition into that marketplace. I'd be really interested in whether your model indicates that would happen. I, uh, I actually did present this to um, to Mitre Corporation as a um, as a research topic they they, um, they have posed as being interested in this. Uh, it would need to be increased then to several million um, agents mm -hmm. uh, and seeing what the impact is from uh, going from you know the, uh, essentially segmented uh, method um, uh, communities that are only able to buy within their community versus uh, expanding to um, all all nationwide and seeing if that has any impact on the mm -hmm. on. For tractability, you don't have to look at nationwide. Pick a region, pick New England. Yeah. Well, well, wouldn't that just work out to be the zero intelligence model? Um, How so? So um, your agents would, would be able to um, buy healthcare markets within their own regions. There'd be less supply, less demand, but they would still work out to be the average for the for the whole market? Uh, possibly not, because I mean, this, it would this clear the market of. Well, remember that we're also looking at um, different services that might be provided. So you might live in one region where the, um, you know, a, a plan, uh, all the plans that are offered to the market uh, include a, a suite of services that you have no interest in, but there's this one, you know, five states over that has exactly the kind of um, services that you're looking at. So that kind of, I think that's what what, what was meant by um, increasing the competition of being able to, or at least that's what a lot of Republicans have put forth, of really tailoring your plan around what you might need rather than what is stated to be needed for you by other people that are, by, by the, the reigning logic that goes into the, the market as well. You know, that the problem with the zero intelligence traders model is a, a good representation of that. And one of the problems with the Republicans' idea about competition is the assumption that no seller has a crushing information advantage either over his pet his competitors or over the buyers. And I think that assumption does not hold in this market in real life. Yeah. Um, <coughs> that, yeah or or, or uh, over uh, uh, about the supplier base, the, the doctor base. I mean, one of the issues here is that the, 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 the insurance companies know exactly what kind of doctors are cheap to use mm -hmm. and what kind of doctors are not cheap to use. Um, and that's not an outcome-based decision. That's a that's a bottom line-based decision. Well, it is in part because something like three percent of the doctors generate about eighty percent of the malpractice payments, <laughs> and the insurers know which doctors those are. It is in fact quite expensive to send people to those doctors. Yeah, but that happens. The the interesting thing about this cross-state lines, of course, is there's a there's a counter. Uh, experiment that's actually done on a regular basis, and that's the Federal Employee Health Benefit Plan, which is a nationwide plan, large pool mm -hmm. uh, of people, not quite as large as the um, non group, the, un the yeah. unaffiliated market that you've modeled, but still pretty darn big. Yeah, and that's um, that's of course across state lines. There's no. State I was unaware of that. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, that's when you buy Blue Cross Blue Shield under that plan, uh, you'll have maybe half a dozen suppliers. Mm -hmm. Um, and 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 a couple of different formats. You know, you'll have um, you'll have uh, 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 what do you call it? Um, you have all the different health health formats. You have health. Uh, and yeah, PPO. There we go. Yeah, HMO. 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 Right, right. And then within those, there's several different different options. Mm -hmm. So, and I have actually heard years ago when Paul Ryan was a was a vice presidential candidate, him saying, you know, that plan is already in place, and if we do a proposed counter proposal to 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 uh, Obamacare, mm -hmm. uh, we ought to look at that because it works and yeah. it's relatively it's Simple. not that terribly expensive, yeah. you know. And so it's it's uh, so it's operating. Um, we understand the strengths and weaknesses because we've been running it for so many decades. So right. We can well, plan for exactly. It wasn't. It didn't sound to me like an unreasonable proposal. But it, that's the the <coughs> key difference between that and the the sort of this Obamacare created system mm -hmm. that uh, that you've modeled uh, that people without employer the large population mm -hmm. is that it uh, it doesn't have the state boundaries. That's the difference with the system that you're modeling is that it. It, there are there are 52 different Blue Cross Blue Shields in your yeah. system. You can also look yeah. at the managed competition. competition. Uh, it was adopted in California in the, uh, I guess, early 80s. Alan Antoven was the one who came up with this whole compete for the market 
manage competition and have people buy uh, insurance in, in marketplaces. California is a big state. Yeah. Big enough that anything that works on that scale is, is not that far from nationwide. I think it's about, yeah, uh, more than 10% of the, the you know, people living in California. In, yeah. In the United States, so, uh, like more Actually, like more like, yeah, more like, uh, yeah, how many, I think 30 million, 30 million, 40 million, something like that, so yeah. It's, it's like 35. 35 million, so about 10%, so. So we'll, we'll be involved, Kevin, if you really want to make it, it seems to me if you want to make it policy relevant, if you really want yes. to do that, you have to get into the to the bigger pool, right? You so, do, so. Uh, yeah, and, and I'm not sure whether so I, I can continue doing it without years. modeling um, um, providers. Yeah. Um, because providers providers make it a, a three body problem, which for for modelers makes it just all the more uh, complicated um, and complex. Um, but uh, one of the things that was actually a, a kind of real big bugbear for this um, study was getting to medical expenditure costs, um, uh, getting getting data for that. Um, <laughs> so uh, that that's been um, there is the National Medical Expenditure Panel Survey, but unfortunately that is not granulated. By um, um, by individual, it is quantiles and and portions of the population. Um, so I can tell that the um, you know the the highest quartile has an average cost of this, and it just means in medians. So um, the data is out there. I just wasn't able to, to get access to it. So but um, you cited French. You cited David French. Yeah, yeah, and French and um, French and Jones. And he has he has done very fine binning of all those data. Yes, things. or he yeah he had studies that did have. Uh, granularized data. I'm not sure if it was the same he has, medical center. I think he has, he's built out of the granular data, he's built the histogram data. Okay. Because he can't, you know, he can't expose the data to Yeah, that. yeah. Yeah, but, um, and I, I, you know, it, um, he did a lot of, I think, valid analysis, including the, the ARMA model that he developed. Uh, I mean, that was, that was the extent of his paper, so that's, um, uh, or their paper is Prince and Jones. But you, uh, back to the question, like, you, sure. think it's just, you think it's very hard to do the provider side? Uh, yes, <laughs> I think it, yes, I think it will be because um, the providers themselves have their own cost benefit um, um, algorithm that I, I'm not sure if it's even really well known. I'm not sure if it will be utility driven or um, you know how to, um, how how the decisions are, are taken into account. Um, I mean, and you, have, you have different tiers of providers too, it's with true. expertise and specialties. And I mean, you can see they, they self select into different mm -hmm. acceptable income levels, mm -hmm. right? right? Depending on. And also, I mean, the, the different costs being also and equivalent cost. to the different, different yes. qu uh, qualities. It was mentioned earlier on, you know, 3% of providers cost are 80% of the malpractice. So the, the, <laughs> the poor quality um, providers versus the, the high quality, you know, trained specialist. Uh, Many but with insurance. providers, e either in hospitals or, or medical groups, there's some cross subsidization going that's, that's basically completely hidden. Mm -hmm. It's internal. Mm -hmm. They're going to do a certain amount of pro bono care. They're going to cut some rates for some uh, yeah. patients and for some right. uh, payers. Yeah. Uh, getting to true cost of care is impossible. <laughs> I've heard. I've heard as much. Um, it really is impossible. Yeah. Um, and I don't think actually. I remember. Uh, there have been a couple of reports where um, patients would go in and say, okay, what is the actual price of what I am doing right now? Well, if you're insured, it's this much. Uh, and if you're uninsured, uh -huh. it's the same exact care. Yeah. And trying to get the actual price of, of that care, whether it's to check out a broken rib, in, in the case of my case, it was next a broken time, rib. Next time you go pick up a prescription, assuming you have insurance, you'll get a little, from a major pharmacy, you'll get a little label that says your insurance paid $85 and your copay is 10 just ask the pharmacist what that would cost if you walked in and bought a One would assume it would be $95, but it's not. I will bet you it's going to be a lot more than $95. Well, well, why do you guys think that's strange? Because if, if, and, and every time you get an airplane, it's the same story these days, yeah. right? Well, airplane yeah. itself is also very... Uh, it's just, it's just, it's just price discrimination. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, you had a question? Just so if you're going to include the providers, there's so much going on between the insurance companies and the providers and many of them if you have a practice of doctors mm -hmm. what they were yep. saying is they can only diagnose a certain condition a certain percentage of time right. and and so in some cases they have intense press pressures not to diagnose yeah. a condition even if a child something really does have it and the child does not get the care because they're not allowed to diagnose that anymore they've reached the maximum and there's just all kinds of weird distortions that are going on because of that. Yeah. I, the reason um, they do that is that under things like Medicare reimbursement rules, 
the payment was tied to the diagnosis, and all of a sudden, everybody who comes in with a cough has pneumonia, double pneumonia, because that's a higher Because then they get a payment. higher, exactly. Yeah. It's, oh. Anyway, but to, two comments before we lose the thread, though, is that one, <laughs> one comment is that, uh, is that uh, it's impossible to do these kinds of deep analyses with new cost economics, because you, you can't have everywhere maximizing agents and expect to solve it, right? Exactly. Yeah. So agents are maybe the best Thing we have to do it. Yes. Okay. That, yeah. So in some sense, it's kind of like a golden goose sitting on the floor here. Maybe, maybe the first person who tries it stumbles on a stumbles on a simple way to represent it, and you can at least do better than what's what we have. That's true. That's true. Which is impossible. Yes. So so you know we can it's if we can do better than impossible impossible now, then. Yeah. The next few conclusions. Oh well. Uh, yeah. D just. Or so but, but then now, now that I, it seems to me that if in fact you're able to do any any version of this, or, or even if you, if you can't do that. It seems to me that it seems what's um, pregnant for analysis, though, whether you want to do it or not, is wh why shouldn't you go down the the route of sampling a single payer? Yeah, and then you can because you, now you have data on Canada and the UK or something, right? Right, and you can you know, and you should uh, that should be a point of a point of comparison. A single <laughs> set of payment rules, multiple payers like Medicare. Fair enough. Much Fair enough. easier yeah. to solve. Yes. Single set yeah. rules, yeah. And yeah. gets you that same benefit that you eliminate the cottage industry exactly. of Markup. 50 coding experts right. for every <laughs> hospital to figure out how to code for the 50 different plans they accept. Right. Yes. Sorry, last comment. Or, sorry. <laughs> my, my only comment. One, one of the uh, this is, I think, is a, another example of cheap, fast, good, big two. Yeah. And yeah. so, in in other places, you have they've gone with cheap and good, mm -hmm. not fast. It's true. Yeah. And what we've what we've said is we want all three. Yeah. We want it cheap. We want it fast. We want it good. And it, you've got to give up one of them. Mm -hmm. I think I think I would modify that. I think we want a market that offers to individuals all three, from which an individual can choose two. And I don't think that's an unreasonable. Absolutely asking for all three from a system for everybody is, is impossible. So maybe you have, maybe have, maybe have the single payer provide the backstop too, and then you can have some, somebody else can, pick, can offer the other. Which I think if you lift the lid and look at what goes on in Britain, uh -huh, that's, that's what is going list. on. Well, if you, Canada There's has, health insurance has the perfect it. plan for that. They offer cheap and good. And if you want good and fast, you go to the US. <laughs> No, you go to the private health market, right? Uh, well, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, Britain and, and and Canada do actually have health insurance markets, but yeah, those right. are but they're not, they're not cheap um, because they don't provide they don't provide they provide good fast care, but it, it's not cheap to provide it. Okay. Yeah. One of, oh, go did you have? Uh, my mind is not a question per se, but I would like to know uh, if it would be possible to have all the presentation slides uploaded on Blackboard so that we could have access to them. As long yeah. as the presenters, sure, I'm okay. Deck. I'm yeah, I'm okay with that. What is all the presentation so far? Yeah, and then subsequent oh. one. Yeah. yeah, I think so. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll we can do. talk to we'll talk to Karen about it afterwards, yeah. and uh, yeah. people can make. I have a quick. I want to go back to the <laughs> issue of um, yeah. mentioned it would be impossible to to or create additional complexity to simulate the providers. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to because you've been working on this for quite some time. I want to know why you think that. Uh, well, so actually, I, I did attempt it. Um, the the real issue was I was having trouble with determining that cost algorithm because all these all these costs, you know, they, they are it's updated based on their own decisions and their and their own inputs and outputs. And determining even a notional heuristic for how a provider determines their cost, they quote to the payer and the patient, uh, proved to be I, I I couldn't find any data or any kind of heuristic for even determining for even beginning to determine that. So I just I, I went with the already the the, the um, pre-established um, uh, numbers or, or um, distributions for medical expenditures, and went with some very notional heuristic data that that uh, I think accountants would be relatively okay with, uh, as far as kind of a number crunching of if you know if I'm at a loss and I raise my prices, if I'm if I uh, have a gain, then I don't need to bother with my my prices. So here's one hint though for you, Kevin. So it turns out. Um, uh, about a decade ago, a PhD student in economics who was mm -hmm. looking at this stuff, right. Carl Johnston, he was actually oh, a fellow at the at You mentioned him, yeah, yeah, and then he g went to go work for the American uh, Enterprise exactly. Institute? Okay. So, but now he was the kind of guy, he, so basically he, had, he spent several years, one of these guys, it took like 15 years to finish his PhD. Uh, he, he, I'm not he, at 15 years he's yet. Uh, <laughs> he, uh, but, but Carl, basically, he, you know, he tried to do it in, in neoclassical terms, gave up, and he came over here and he took all, took our, all of our classes, that mm -hmm. was, that was you know, progress. But then here's what I think that there may be something there is that 
and he actually got Machik to to help him write the model, and, and we all know Machik was a very yeah. capable guy, right? And so they have one paper on this, and you should okay. look at that. Cause yeah, really, absolutely. Really good gut science. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not going to include it in my dissertation. <laughs> so <laughs> my dis I, I've already set the, the, the pre-defense. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I will take... Uh, they I'll have take three providers in there. So. Okay, all right. But um, it, it would just seem... Um, so, so sorry, I cut someone. It would just seem like it, it would be um, easier than, than it might appear because um, you actually don't need to have all the rules specified Exactly. I think what's interesting about having the providers is the heterogeneity of the rules. Oh, absolutely. Right? Mm -hmm. Right, right. I mean, that's what will be interesting, what the effects would be mm -hmm. on your simulation, because the providers are not only enclosed geographically, but they have different rules. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really matter what the rules are, right? It's just yeah. as long as they're different and as long as they have some quirks or whatever. Then you can actually just make it up and conceptually understand that, that system, right? Yeah, for, for example, the, the, famous, the famous case of this, so it's, it's well it's well documented in the conventional income literature. There are there are two social norms, two me, two medical norms for cardiac care in Florida. Okay. So if you have a heart attack on the East Coast, uh, and you need a, you know, say a triple bypass or something, there's a certain way it's done. And if you do it, have it on the West Coast of Florida, you have this, the, the the procedure is the same name, but it's done in a completely orth orthogonal way. It's done with Different, you know, huh. treatments, etc. Different protocols. Yeah. It, the cost ends up being comparable. But basically, all, all the doctors on the East Coast have been trained uh, in the, on the American East Coast. Okay. On the West Coast, they've been trained in the American South, like in the Deep South somewhere. Huh. And so, anyway, so this has been written about that. There's this, you know, these, it, you know it's, huh. it's just a, it's, it's it's completely idiosyncratic uh, right. heterogeneity. Yeah. But and it it, it, it's, right, it doesn't really matter at, at the level of, of, of yeah. what it costs. Yeah. But, it, but it matters at the level of physiology. Right. Like, you, well, you know. Yeah. Well, I mean, one of the interesting things on, on the rules would be this assessment of quality. Are we pushing out high quality providers for the, and, and is the, the market being flooded with low quality? Uh, I don't know. Lots that of choices easy. of low quality versus two yeah. choices of high quality. Right, right, right. Yeah. right. So, Kevin, Kevin, your model was in? Uh, Python. Python? Yeah. And your data analysis was also in? Uh, it was in Python and R. Last question, Doug, you have one more. Yeah, the place you can look for the uh, the quality and outcomes data would be Brent James at Intermountain Health okay. out in Utah. He was the leading light on the Institute of Medicine's studies of preventable deaths in the healthcare system. Okay. So he knows a lot more than he'll publish okay. about how you tell who are okay. the higher risk providers. If you get providers in there, you can always then, if for your postdoc, not, not for this dissertation, you can then hide behind Churchill's theorem. Winston Churchill was chancellor of the Exchequer. Mm -hmm. His chief economist told him it would take 10 years to produce an estimate of the total cost of the great war to the nation because they were dependent on external sources and you know a whole bunch of sure. reasons. I say, so if I give him my best guess at three this afternoon, it will take 10 years for anyone to prove me wrong. <laughs> <laughs> can I have one other question? I'm thinking about the, the, the time frame, the duration of the problems that your agents yeah. are solving. And I mean, if you look at healthcare over a long term, and in the military, they have things like total ownership cost types of questions. Um, you know, are, is either the, I mean, is the payer at all incentivized in this model to encourage preventative or better care that reduces a longer term cost? Because the way I see it now, they're only interested in you know that maybe that year, mm -hmm. and so they may be making the money they need, and they can continue to work the system. But over time, those costs continue to grow because there's no cap or no no emphasis on reducing this in the long term and having a long term profit on either of these individuals. And I'd be interested in how you could potentially introduce that to this kind of model, so yes. not looking at say. Because I mean, adding the providers adds a whole other level of complexity. But but looking at that long term sure. uh, decision frame mm -hmm. could really it, it introduces an interesting set of complexity and, and gets to some of the See, bigger problems. See, those risk corridors are doing the exact opposite of that. That's why I'm but, so surprised. But I'm that interested how we could doing do that. this in yeah. the model. So that uh, and that was the hope of the um, uh, of the coverage or the individual mandate was to encourage people to get insured so that they are okay with going to a physician and catching problems early so that preventing those long-term morbidity uh, costs that might incur down the line of you have a problem with your health or we, we were able to find cancer in um, stage one mm -hmm. so it doesn't progress to stage four. Mm -hmm. 
But your model doesn't create. My space. my model does not look at that, and and but that would be a very interesting thing of this preventative care. Um, because uh, I mean, as, as we, you know, you talk about these these, these ideas, these different policies, mm -hmm. they're thinking all these long term costs. The medical mm -hmm. health care is going up and up, and nobody can afford it. Well, then we need to also look at the long term decision making. Right. With, with Right. Well, people are yeah, yeah and people are living longer than yeah. They when you look at these yeah. incentives, if you if you actually do get people to take better care of themselves and they reduce their costs, and then that insurance, if the insurance company is successful, all they're going to do then is attract people, the opposite kind of people, the people who don't, because then they they are you know the free riding then on the system, right. mm -hmm. and it's just going to drive you know you're just going to go back to the normal. It'll again. be self correcting. It, it, yeah, and, and so so there's no incentive for them to, to do that. Mm -hmm. Unless you created those incentives artificially in the system. But again, you're really trying to do brain but surgery on the market here. Yeah, but then you're trying, but you're trying, but you don't want people to be successful. You know, they don't want well, the companies to I mean, be that's successful because the, the then they want to the main criticism them, that, so the Demo that, that then they get profitable. And yeah. Yeah. That's the main and criticism that the, that the Democrats <laughs> make on the, on the, the free market proposals is that you have no incentive to look at long term of, yeah. of procuring the, the long term health of these patients and thus reducing the, the overall health costs. You uh, know, in the energy market, most of it's regulated. The utilities are all regulated. Their profits are regulated. They cannot earn more than their, too much more than their costs. Um, and in fact, there are methods to incentivize electric companies, especially to cause you to reduce your long-term usage of electricity. Uh, and that's, that's actually happening. Some could argue that it's not happening as much. In, in theory, the electric company would want you to buy as much electricity as they could possibly get into your house because, uh, you know, take away all the insulation because then we sell more and consequently. But that's the usual di difference, Ken, with this invoked with, with health is that's a Yes, uh, more electricity and more power is associated with higher economic output. The trouble is, right, that is in, in general, you know, if, if you're, for example, if you're, if you're a heart patient, uh, you say two heart surgeries is not better than one heart surgery, yeah. right? I don't want to have. <laughs> so this know, isn't necessarily a net gain to a person. <laughs> most but, things, but, but most person, interventions but are things you don't want to have more of. So I in some want sense, lower cost. So how more healthcare costs right. ten but years from now for me. Health is a good, but the mm -hmm. trouble is the service to improve your health is actually a bad. See, it's a, it's a bad. You want you want yeah. less of it. I don't want lower, fewer services. I want lower costs. So well, the way the way you handle the way you handle that is to go to capitated care. So instead of payment for service, you pay for healthy years of life of your beneficiaries. Mm -hmm. Then there's a huge incentive to provide preventive care. But when you have people who can jump around between plans, you know, that's that's the trouble. That's, that's, where, that's where I refer to more of more of a single payer system. They, they are I just think this is going to have a lot of public um, attention. That's why I'm sharing this on Facebook. So you know, smile <laughs> for the cameras because this is actually uh, I, so I'm sharing this think, right now on Facebook. Do you think you should shave the beard when he goes on TV? <laughs> <laughs> it's too late. It's already out there. It's right? already yeah, it's already out there. Mm -hmm. yeah, so yeah. before Kevin goes, though, you have to yes. give us the 30 second version uh, where, in which you meet Paul Ryan in the elevator, okay? Oh. And, and, <laughs> and I require that you use the phrase, um, "I get a death spiral because" in your answer. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to do this right now on the yep, spot. Yep, yep. All right. Uh, <laughs> One elevator ride. All right. Closing. <laughs> uh, was able to show that um, the individual mandate actually does prevent uh, the spiral from occurring. However, the risk adjustment does cause to a reduction in um, choices for the payer, uh, and thus reducing um, the um, freedom of choice among uh, among patients across the country. And your and your constituents are seeing that. Now, before Rob pushes any more on that, because he's <laughs> about to, okay, <laughs> let me tell you a story that Rob likes to say about the guy that he met in an, ele in an elevator, and he was telling him about his great work, and he was like, oh, I've never seen a supply and demand curve move before. <laughs> so you just want to make sure you have a good visual and everything will be possible. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's thank Kevin. And yeah. I'm sure you're happy to take comments, uh, yes. either written or otherwise. Uh, yeah, up until about 4:30, which I need to go pick up my kid. So <laughs> I just see. No. Oh, I, 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 I just said that. Yes.